Walk me through the, the three great untruths, because mm -hmm. I think almost each one of them feels like it is the antithesis is rooted in Stoic wisdom. Yep, exactly. So I think, yes, yeah, so I sent you that sheet that yeah. I give to my students. So I'll tell you the great truth, and yeah. then why don't you read a quote that okay. is the exact All antithesis right. of it. Okay. So, so great untruth, number one, um, is um, uh, um, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, yes. meaning you should avoid unpleasant things because yes. they'll harm you, they'll traumatize you, they'll damage you like paper cuts. So avoid unpleasant things. What would the Stoics say? Well, in, in meditations, Marx really says, uh, the impediment to action advances yeah. action, what stands in the way becomes the way. And basically the whole exactly. idea is that everything is fuel for you to practice yeah. some virtue. So the idea, it's not that everything magically, you know, helps you make more money or be happier, but it, it's that, you know, frustrating people are a chance to practice patience. Yep. You know, someone mm -hmm. uh, someone hurting you is a chance to practice forgiveness. Uh, you know, a delay is a chance to practice this. Or that. You know, the mm -hmm. idea is that these things, if you see them as resistance training Exa for yes. developing the yes. countervailing virtue, then it's you're not gonna, you're, you're probably never gonna get to the point where you're excited that bad stuff is happening, right. but you you understand and you have confidence in your ability yes. to learn from and grow and do things because mm -hmm. of this thing you didn't want to yeah. happen happening. That's right. So the key idea there is what we call in psychology, anti-fragility, Yes, a term made up by Nassim Taleb. Um, and that, right, we, we need that it, resistance training. We need to strain the muscles in order to strengthen the muscles. Um, and uh, let's see, was there anything else to say about, about that? So that's the first, the first great untruth. Yes. Um, okay, second great untruth. Um, always trust your feelings. <laughs> what do you think? What would the Stoics say about that? Yeah, the Stoics are saying of all the things to trust, your feelings are at the absolute bottom of the list. You know, your feelings are constantly misleading you. They're saying, hey, every time you have an impression, every time you have a feeling, they're like, put it to the test. Yes, that's right. The Stoics say we have this, the the the, the feeling of fantasia or fantasia I forget the the Greek word but the idea is you have that initial reaction but then you have the ability to go is this yeah. true mm -hmm. do I want this do I want to feel this way and and also I think the the distinction I make is having the feelings if you feel it it is true like you are angry well, I, the, I, it's true that you're feeling something that's what but it I mean. doesn't mean but, but yeah. I'm saying you feel if something has made you feel anger that's there's a difference between then acting on said anger mm -hmm. right do you know what I mean so the, I think when people say trust their feelings they don't just mean go like uh, what they mean is that your feeling and what it's telling you to do is the right thing and that's but, but it's definitely not, it's not, not true. just what it's telling you to do it's what it's telling you is real so if someone has made you angry, the anger emotion causes you to perceive a justice violation. Yeah. They mistreated me, they did something they shouldn't do, and therefore the implication is someone needs to punish them, possibly yes. me or maybe yes. I report it. Yes. Um, so uh, so you know, feelings are important, but this is the whole point of CBT, and this is the close relationship between Stoicism and CBT, is you know, Aaron Beck and the others in the 60s and 70s found that people will spontaneously look for evidence that their feeling is right. Yes. We'll look for reasons to back up your anger at your wife or your teacher, whoever. Um, but we don't spontaneously look for evidence on the other side. Yeah. That's a discipline, that's a practice. Yes. And that's what CBT teaches you to do. Yeah, so. Epictetus's line is, remember when you're offended that you are complicit in taking offense. Yeah, that's right. And I, that's so right. I think realizing that, hey, yeah, what? because basically the core of stoicism is things are, and then our opinion, like things are objective, mm -hmm. our opinions about them are subjective. So you go, That's right. they said something, it exists. It was a mm -hmm. combination of sounds yep. and whatever. But the idea that what they said is offensive or racist right. or cruel mm -hmm. or wrong, that requires you mm -hmm. to ascribe a judgment to that that's thing. Right. And that's not and to say- And you could that, be wrong. Yes. You could be right, but you really could be wrong. Yeah, and, and that, yeah, that's not to say that everything is okay mm -hmm. and that yeah. we should just accept people. And, and yeah. it certainly doesn't mean that you should go around doing those things. That's right, that's right. But it says, hey, let's step back and let's, is there another way I could see this? Yeah, that's right. Right, right. and if we could, you know, if we could basically just, you know, cut our outrage reactions by 90%, Yeah then we'd only be five or 10 times as angry as we were 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? um, All right, what's so, the third great okay. entry? So the third is really the most damning. It's the one that causes the most problems yeah. worldwide. And that is life is a battle between good people and evil people. What would mm. the Stoics say about that? You know, I was, I was actually thinking about that one. This is, 
I, I wonder if people might think that actually the Stoics agree, because this is the passage, this is the opening of Meditations, uh, book two. Book one is, is gratitude, right. but book two is Marcus Aurelius saying, when you awake in the morning, tell yourself, the people I will deal yeah. with today will be meddling and ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and surly, and they are like this because they can't tell good from evil. But I have seen the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil. Okay, but he still isn't saying that they are evil. Well, what I was going to say- He's saying, you know, have some forbearance with these people. Agreed. But what I was going to say, so you think he's saying, hey, look, there's good people and bad mm -hmm. people. And, and I think there are good people and bad people. But he says, uh, but I recognize in the wrongdoer a nature related to my own, of not of the same blood or birth, but the same mind. And so they can't hurt me. And he says, no one can implicate me in ugliness, mm -hmm. nor can I feel angry at my relative or hurt him because we were born to work together like right. feet, hands, and eyes, like two that. rows of teeth, yeah. upper and lower. Yeah. To feel anger at someone, to turn your back on him, this is an obstruction. That's right. That's right. There's in 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 Aurelius and in in the other Stoics, there's an awareness, as there is in great literature, that people are complicated. Yeah. Um, there's a line we we quote in in the Coddling of the American Mind from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who said, "The line between good and evil runs through every human heart," mm -hmm. and great literature shows you that, whereas cartoons and social media. Are the opposite. There are good people and bad people, and we all have to get together now to chime in, to condemn this. To so, um, yeah. So a world that is less moralistic, more humble, slower to judge, quicker to forgive—that's the kind of world that I think we all want to live in. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm writing about this in the Justice Book now. Is like. Today, when people use the word like allies, like, are you an ally? Uh, what yeah. they're saying is like, do you think exactly what I think and agree with me 100%? When in fact, allies historically, politically in the history of war is about people with a variety of different views and interests mm -hmm. finding common ground on specific things where mm -hmm. they can work together right. and solve right. specific problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Churchill's line was something like, "The only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies." Um, and and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but that actually the great social movements, the great social change, has come from allies who were not at all in lockstep, but found agreement mm -hmm. enough in a right. specific issue that and and then had the forbearance and the tolerance and the open mindedness to say, you know, I don't care about all the things we disagree with. Mm -hmm, I care right. about the things that we agree with. I, I'm- A more uh, pragmatic approach. Yeah. Um, less moralistic. Yeah, like if Harvey Milk, uh, how does Harvey Milk come to power in San Francisco? He allies with the Teamsters. Oh, cool. Uh, and he helps them, uh, the, the Teamsters are boycotting uh, bars in San Francisco, uh, who or they're boycotting Coors uh, beer. Okay. In, and, and he says, I'll help you get it out of gay bars if, you start hiring gay drivers. Oh wow! And okay. and yeah, then pragmatic. that that relationship yeah. is what ultimately that's his first sort of political constituency. Mm. And so uh, even even in the women's rights movement, I talk a lot about this. It's like the the, the women who got together and said women should deserve uh, to vote, or, or mm -hmm. you know, are constitutionally. Uh, able to vote. You know, they're saying there there was Mormon women who were po uh, polygamous. There mm -hmm. was black women and white women, rich women and poor women. Mm -hmm. And they had, if you ask them what the role of women in society was, they would have very different answers. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, uh, should women yeah. be given access to the ballot? They mm -hmm. were in agreement there. Yeah, that's right. and, and I think that's, right. that's our problem so much now with good mm -hmm. and evil is like someone's all good or all mm -hmm. evil. Well, that's right. When politics is about horse trading, uh, strategic alliances to achieve outcomes, yes. then that's what politics is supposed to be for. Yes, and that's then how it works. it's effective. But what's happened, because as I say in The Righteous Mind, you know, we evolved for small scale societies that are deeply religious, that circle around sacred objects to make us stronger, especially in battle against other groups. That's the kind of minds that we have. We don't have to be tribal, we can calm that down, but it's very easy to ramp it up. And our politics, unfortunately, has morphed in the, you know, in the TV age or, and before, you know, it was more pragmatic stuff, but especially in the social media age, and this began in the TV age with cable TV, it gets much more moralistic. We get a culture war mentality, yeah. and now it's us versus them. It's yeah. red team versus blue team. Yeah. And you know, the way our founding fathers set up American democracy, or I should say a republic with democratic features, it can't function no. if 
we are two opposing tribes who cannot compromise. Yeah, because you're almost never going to get an absolute majority. You have to create uh, a majority by cobbling together several different yeah. minorities. And yeah. and yeah, if you have this uh, us or them, good versus evil mentality, you're, you're probably not going to be able to do that because you're going right. to be too pure for it, too that's self-righteous that's for that's it. That's right. That's right. So I think we're in agreement yes. that our society is in huge trouble. But if uh, the ideas of the ancients, especially the Stoics, were more widely understood, we would have a citizenry with the virtues that the founding fathers kind of hoped that we would have. Yes. How's that? I agree. I totally agree.